our next speaker uh, is probably one of the, the smartest people I know while also being one of the most engaging. He is an assistant professor at the Pratt Institute in Brooklyn as well as a quantitative analyst at the investment management firm Two Sigma. And during the his free time, which I'm not sure how he manages that, he runs a very well-known blog, iQuant New York. Uh, please welcome to the stage, Ben Wellington. Thank you. Thank you, hi. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here today. Let me grab this guy. Um, as I said, my name is uh, uh, Ben Wellington, and I'm going to today tell you about, uh, I guess, my, my journey over the last year and a half um, as basically a, a citizen of, of New York City. Um, I set out maybe about that long ago to, to start a blog. And my idea was, well, look, we have all this data going to the public. How can we use it to start to change policy? In fact, can a citizen, can somebody with no connection to government, start to get a city to change the way it operates through open data and a blog? And that was my, that was my, my, my thought about, about a year and a half ago. So I've, uh, I, I started to do that, and, and some interesting things happened. Today I'm going to tell you about, about that journey, about what I've learned along the way, uh, and about you know, some best practices of how to have an impact with the data that you use. Um, so uh, I guess I'll call it stories from urban data science. Why not? So in short, I, I now call myself a data storyteller. Uh, it was, you know, I don't know, I, I kind of fell into this role um, not, not on purpose, but I'll tell, you about, I'll tell you about that story. And it started with me as basically a data scientist in short. As was mentioned, I work actually at an investment company um, called Two Sigma, where I work with data all day, using uh, all different kinds of data to kind of see where um, uh, investments might, might move. Um, and so this was my, my kind of day job. And then something happened. I married an urban planner, Leslie, my wife. Um, and so, you know, for a while, these two worlds were, were, were separate. You could see how the cocktail parties might have been divided. Um, not that I had cocktail parties, but if I did, they would have been divided. Uh, um, and uh, this stayed this way a while, and, and I think our worlds were kind of separate until something, you know, started to happen. That was the open data movement, which started to bring these two worlds together. In New York City, this was 2012, where uh, then Mayor Bloomberg signed into law uh, the open data laws in New York, basically compelling city agencies um, to release the data to the public that they have. It's an interesting way to go about it as a city, um, legislating versus sort of having it come down from the executive branch because it can lead to some tension. But nonetheless, it led to a lot of data being released, which is, which is very exciting. When Mayor Bloomberg uh, uh, put that out, he said, look, across city government, agencies use data to develop policy, implement programs, and track performance. Each month, our administration shares more and more of this data with the public at large, catalyzing the creativity, intellect, and enterprising spirit of computer programmers to build tools that help us all improve our lives. So this is the 2012 New York City Open Data Vision, right, coming, coming straight from the mayor during the bill signing. Um, Getting that point was a bit of a journey, but once we were there, okay, let's embrace it. And very much what we've seen in New York are, are, are this, is a focus mainly, I would say, on apps when it comes to interfacing with the public. Of course, they've had the, the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics, which has in, mostly been internal, historically. But when it comes to interfacing with the public, it was really about apps. Um, and this is actually even before the open data. We had app competition in New York City. This is not a New York City issue, uh, not issue, but a New York City initiative. We see this across the country. I was just in Taipei. Uh, uh, last week and learned that, too, the federal government holds app competitions with open data to try to promote it. Um, so this is really a group, this is a really big way people engage with the community. But it's, it always has struck me because what I noticed from Mayor Bloomberg's quote, and this is, this is once again 2012 New York City, but um, that, that open data was about computer programmers. And I was sitting there going, you know, well, yeah, it is. Computer programmers can play a vital role, especially if they're going to make these apps that we keep having competitions on. But it can be much bigger, right? It's not just computer programmers. And so I think this kind of missed the, the, missed the, the boat there when this came out. Um, it's, and I've always seen it as, as more, you know, whereas agencies and, and sometimes cities see it, open data through computer programmers to apps, because everyone loves apps, uh, to the public, that it's a lot bigger, right? Policymakers, nonprofits, planners. Um, and and, and we, we don't need to go through this app. You know, we don't need to go through this app world. And how do we get there? Well, tools, right? Uh, uh, we see things like data lens that Socrates is doing, but in general, we need more tools to make things more accessible to everybody. Um, so part of my talk today is to show that, look, you can do things even if you aren't uh, 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 a data you know, guru. There's stuff that we can all do. And that's just what's so great about open data, right? It's not about it. Now, I should mention um, that, uh, in fact, I think maybe even only a month ago, New York City released uh, 
a new vision of open data, which was more sort of open data for all, um, for, for all citizens. And so there has been a shift very, very recently in the view of this, but it's a slow, it's a slow moving paradigm shift. And I'm still not seeing, you know, data science competitions in the way we have big app competitions, right? I think we'll get there. Um, and I, I'd like to see other, other cities do that as well. So, right, the, the, we, this is a recognizable place for, for many of you. Uh, this is the New York City Open Data Portal circa uh, a, a few months ago. Um, there's the Open Knowledge Foundation's rating of different cities. You prob some of you coming from cities are probably aware of, of this kind of thing. You can see um, it's kind of crowdsourced. It's interesting. People submit the data sets and, and it gets edited, and these rankings move around quite a bit. There's national rankings, there's city rankings. Um, and so, before all this, right, though, what did the world look like? It looked, it looked a lot like this, right? Where, charts and graphs. This is one from the Taxi and Limousine Commission in New York City. And it was built to tell us in New York how many taxis we have. That's useful. How many four hire vehicles like, like Uber and how many uh, of these borough taxis, which are special taxis that can only bring you into Manhattan but not out of Manhattan, which isn't great for the environment, but, but it's the way it is. Um, uh, so these charts, if you ever stop and think about where do they come from? Like, and maybe many of you know this because maybe you're on the other side, but these charts come from somebody at an agency says, hmm, this is the type of chart that the public should know or that needs to go in this report. And they go and they run a bunch of statistics and they, or, or do a you know, query or they count or whatever they do and they make a chart. And this is how data got to the public for so long, right? Um, going back to the, to, you know, behind this before the census. Um, but with open data, it's a little different, right? Here, this is a set idea that someone within an office decides to share. But with open data, you're opening up the data. There's no more set idea of what to share. There's just the data set. And what can you do with the data set? Well, really an infinite number of things, right? You can ask an infinite number of questions from any data set. So we're going from one answer to possibly, you know, literally an infinite number of answers just by releasing the data. It's no longer filtered. So I look at taxi data, and as much as it's fun to count taxis, which is kind of interesting, I've always thought, OK, we have all these cabs. And in New York, we've got GPS recorders in every cab, which is really cool. And they pick people up, they drop them off, and they record the GPS location. And we've got, uh, we know how long it took. So the little high school physics, you know, distance equals rate time. We can actually figure out the speed of the cabs. And I'm thinking, all right, that's kind of neat. With the cabs, that means we can kind of say, and the cabs are kind of centered in Manhattan. So I was curious, can this give us a view of the speed of cars in New York City? How fast is, when is rush hour in New York? How bad is it? And I was like, all right, this is kind of, this is, this, I can learn something about the city I live in. When is rush hour? So I charted the average speed of every cab in New York City per minute of day and got, um, got this plot. And uh, what you see here is at 5 a.m., they're out there fastest at 24 miles per hour, amazingly fast. But the, the turnaround is quite shocking. It's a, it's a very sharp turnaround. Things start going bad at 5.18 in the morning, and they get worse and worse until about 8.30 in the morning where the average New York City taxi um, is running at 11 and a half miles per hour, at least those with passengers in them. And I, and I learned that, in fact, there's no rush hour in New York City. It's just a rush day. It's 11 and a half miles per hour all day. Um, this is the kind of thing that, this is not maybe the chart you'd see on, on the front of nyc.gov, um, but it's interesting. And imagine you can run this in any neighborhood. You could run this for any set where people are going. Trips to the airport. That sounds interesting if you're trying to get there on time. By the way, if you are, just set your alarm for 5 in the morning and you're good. Um, uh, in New York, it's exciting. So, so open data allows us to start asking these questions. And in fact, to, this, this data, when, the, when I made this chart, um, maybe around a year ago, this data actually came through freedom of information law requests that were repeatedly filled by the Tax and Limousine Commission. Every, you know, every day they'd have people come down with hard drives and put the data on. And it was very in frustrating and inefficient. Um, as of last month, the Tax and Limousine Commission in New York City has posted every single taxi ride online um, on both the Socrata portal and in, in other formats uh, for people to, uh, uh, to, to work with. So this was sort of a freedom of information story before, and now it's an open data story. So things, once again, are moving in a great direction, and we can start to ask all these great questions. So um, in essence, when data science and urban planning, I, I started this blog, as I mentioned, as, as a bit of an experiment. Um, it was an offshoot from a class I was teaching urban planners about statistics. My wife was, in, was, was at Pratt and um, was taking a statistics class and would come home every day and say, why do I have to learn this, right? Which we would probably, any statistics student would say. And, and I was sitting there going, look, we live, why are we using textbooks? We have all this public data in New York and we have urban planners in New York. Why don't we combine these two into a stats class instead of using a statistics textbook with made up problems? So I ended up creating this course at Pratt um, and to make the homeworks interesting, I had to find fun things about the city. And I realized it might be more fun than just the, to the 12 people in my class. Uh, and so that's where the blog came from as part of this sort of thought experiment. Look, can we make a difference? And, and I'm, I'm having fun in this class. Let's see what we can do 
more broadly. So I started to do something, somewhere tongue in cheek. This is a map of, um, I went out to, to find where the best place during 4th of July to watch illegal fireworks. And so what better way than using complaints about illegal fireworks <laughs> to figure out where to go in Inwood and Manhattan is the best place to watch illegal fireworks. What I liked about this post was that I wrote about this, and once again, it was kind of tongue in cheek. Um, but uh, the next day, the New York Times did, a, did sort of a deep dive on illegal fireworks in Inwood. And they, they, you know, they said, this is the best place. Nothing to do with my work. They weren't, they weren't looking at my work. But the fact that you know, the reporters and, and my, my quirky graph came to the same place was, was a bit exciting. Um, uh, so, so some of it's kind of silly. Uh, some of it's more real. This is a map of bicycle collisions in New York City. Um, by the way, I'm not a designer. I'm, I'm a data person, so you'll have to excuse any of my graphs that are ugly. Um, but the, the red area here are places with more bicycle collisions. What's happening? Well, we have a lot of cyclists coming in from Brooklyn, uh, which is uh, on the east side of the, of the map here, uh, in, the, in the sort of the south side there. We have Williamsburg down here, where we're seeing a lot of collisions. There's a lot of cyclists, more cyclists, more collisions. That makes sense. They're coming in over the bridges, and we're seeing large amounts of accidents in Manhattan. And then this other area uh, in Queens called Roosevelt uh, Avenue. So these are kind of known things in New York. I was writing about them. And, um, Something interesting happened when I did. Right, this, this, I, and by the way, this was me learning this, this software called QGIS. So urban planners use GIS as spatial software. A lot of the time when I'm using the longitude latitude or the shape files put out by government agencies, I'm doing it through GIS. The ArcGIS is, the, is a non-open source version. So it was more of an experiment. Well, what can I do with that? You know, I was kind of like file save heat map. Like it, it wasn't really analysis. It was kind of, all right, let's just save this heat map and do some counts. So I wrote about it and these, these, this story started to spread. This is very early on in the blog. Um, Cyclist injuries, New York City mapped. Uh, somebody said, uh, traffic fatality map pegs Broadway structure of Williamsburg as a death trap. I was like, I never said that. <laughs> Be careful with your data. Uh, heat map shows where traffic, and then I went to the Atlantic. And, I'm, and, and, and uh, on the Atlantic's blog, uh, mapping New York's traffic crashes. And, and all these stats started to come out. And I'm sitting there going, I literally went to file save as, and it's like going to the Atlantic. <laughs> this is really weird. What is happening here? Why is, this, why is this blog, why are these posts moving around? And it turns out there's just a lot of demand for for sort of ingestible data and information. Um, and I thought about it and I experimented for a while, and I realized there was something else that maybe is not part of, of, of data curriculum in New York, or even science curriculum, but maybe should be, not New York, excuse me, uh, in, in the US. Um, and that's, that's maybe storytelling. I'm gonna be a little cheeky here, take a step back, because I also have another hobby, which is improv comedy. <laughs> um, I, do, I do improv, and in improv you learn how to tell a story. So I'm gonna talk about, you know, storytelling, if you're a scientist and you're, you're only talking to other scientists, then, you know, your, your, your message is not going to get out. Very often we see, there's a lot of people doing really interesting work in data science and data analysis, but often they're, they're writing about the Python code they ran and how they compiled the program instead of sort of something that's more generally applicable. So I kind of tried, all right, well, what if I write for everybody? What if I open this up and think about storytelling first and foremost? And there's a couple of things from improv that you learn that I tied back to my blog and, and I'll share those with you. Um, so, I, so that's sort of data storytelling to me. First, in improv, uh, connect with people's experiences is, is a thing you say. So if you're going to do a scene, right, you probably, you want to think about what people relate to. And so you might do a scene, you know, brushing your teeth in front of a mirror, you know, talking to your spouse or something. And people can say, oh, yeah, I've been there. I know that's, a fun, that's an interesting place to be. And they connect to your scene much better. I think about how to connect to New Yorkers who I write for and what, is it, what it is that they see on their, on their daily lives. For example, um, I was curious. We see a lot of Starbucks in New York. And I, I went on a journey to find the person who lives farthest from a Starbucks in New York City. Um, it turned out that they were, they were uptown. I, I, I didn't go to their, ring their doorbell and say, excuse me, did you know you live farthest from a Starbucks? But I did learn that half of New York was within four blocks of a Starbucks in Manhattan, which is pretty, pretty impressive. Um, so, so that's something very New York. And another thing New Yorkers are frustrated by is our, is our taxi commute in the afternoons. What happens is at 4 p.m. in New York, 4 to 5, 6 o'clock, you go out to get a cab, and the cab goes by and it's got a light on, it says off duty. And then you try to hail it and oh, where are you going? You're going the direction I'm going and you have a fight and they, you know, it's very strange. Um, and if, you, if they like where you're going, they'll pick you up, otherwise they won't, which is not really legal, but it's the way it all works. Um, and, uh, and so it always happens, the rush hour in the afternoon, like four to six. So why is it always bad at four to six? Why is everyone, and it turns out that's the shift change in New York City. Our cabs all change shifts at the same time, all of them. Well, not, not literally all of them, 90, 95% of them, some of them are owner-operated. Um, so these cabs run in two shifts, 12-hour shifts, and at the same time every day, they all say, let's all change now. So this leaves a bit of a, a supply problem. So I plotted the, uh, the amount of revenue per minute that the entire fleet creates in New York City. And you can see 
uh, that ap after midnight things go down at 5 a.m. when not not surprisingly when the when the taxis are fastest they're making the least amount of money because there's no demand and then you see it kind of go back up and then you see this this little dip there around 4 to 5 p.m. I'd added the blue line as sort of hypothetical demand but this is what we're seeing in New York City of actual revenue of our taxi fleet it turns out that's three to four percent of the entire taxi fleet's revenue being lost in that dip during the shift change. So 4% is a pretty, pretty big deal for if you're you know, driving a taxi and that's the amount of money you're gonna, you take home every day. So why are they all doing this at the same time? Right? And it turns out there's some game theory at play. If you and I both drive a cab and we want things to be fair, then there's only one time where we can change keys and have us both make the same amount of money in a 12-hour shift. Mathematically, there's only one time where you drive 12 hours and I drive 12 hours and the demand is equal. It's kind of like an equilibrium point. And it turns out that that's, if you actually plot it out, that's the point where that's equal. What I did here is I charted the next 12 hours revenue of the fleet versus the previous 12 hour revenue of the fleet per time of day. So where they cross, it's saying, all right, the next 12 hours, you make the same amount of money as the previous 12 hours. And they cross right at this afternoon rush hour. So these drivers of the last 20, 30 years have noticed this and things have converged to this single time where everybody changes. This is problematic and using data, you can actually, you know, you can quantify this. Now what the city did is they added a rush hour surcharge, right? Because let's throw more money at the problem, supply and demand. If we add a surcharge at rush hour, we'll get more, more taxis. Did that fix the problem? Well, if you think about what that did, it gave a lot more money to the late shift driver. And the early shift driver is like, well, what is this about? Why does the late shift driver get all this surcharge when I don't? Let's move the equilibrium point later into rush hour to make it more even. <laughs> I don't know if that's what actually happened, but in the game theory says throwing money at the rush hour thing doesn't, doesn't really work. Um, and if you do that, you get this blue crossing point instead of the yellow crossing point. So that's more where we are today, actually later in rush hour. So what can data tell us about fixing this? Well, um, it turns out that if you calculate, the, the cabs are leased. So each driver comes out and leases their cab. If you, and right now, the amount that you lease the cab for is regulated by government. Imagine if you make the 12-hour shifts adjustable rates. That means that the person who drives in a lower demand time can pay less for the, the taxi. The person who goes at a higher demand can pay more for the cab. And then the people will walk away with the same amount of money. So if we release that regulation on, on taxi companies, we can actually solve this by switching the equilibrium point. By, uh, but we can't do that because we have a ceiling right now. And that's where we are in New York today. So data can solve real problems around. And I actually got invited to talk to the um, commissioner in New York City to talk about this, which is a cool way that open data can kind of give back to the city. Um, another thing, I say focus on a single idea. When telling a story, things can get very complicated. You can have lots of things um, going on, and I always try to keep it simple. You see a data set, it's got like 50 columns, and people go, ah, oh, I have no idea what to do with this. Often, I just focus on a few columns, and there's stories to tell in there. Look at maxes and mins in a column. Look at the most common thing. Look at the least common thing. Often, you sort, and there's a story to be told, or you count. Um, this is City Bike Data in New York. This is our bike share program, and I mapped out the gender of all the riders in New York. Uh, of the annual riders and compared male versus female ridership. Uh, and it turns out that in Midtown, our riders are 80 to 90% male, whereas in Brooklyn, uh, uh, down on the south of the map, we have closer to 60 to 70% male. It's interesting for two reasons. One, if you're trying to find a date, you know where to grab a city bike. But, but more importantly, it's a way to start to say, look, we can use public transportation data to study gender. We can look at what time people take bikes to understand safety in different neighborhoods. You'll notice that in safer neighborhoods, the bikes are checked out later than in neighborhoods where people feel less safe. So instead of looking at crime statistics, we can get a sense of what people feel, which is all really interesting. Also, keep it simple. When people hear, oh, you do data, they think it's something like this, right? They have this vision. Um, and this is what's going on in people's head. Uh, and I'm often like, no, 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 you don't understand. It's, it's, it's more like, like this. It's, it's, it's these operators. You can do so much by counting. Now, Look, I work um, in an industry where I'm doing a lot of predictive analytics, and things can get quite complicated. You can use machine learning. You can do a lot of interesting stuff um, with complicated models and do really, really cool stuff. And, and I do that with part of what I do. But I also take a step back and say, what can we do without all that? What can we do with descriptive statistics? For example, the taxi thing I just showed you was just describing the past. These are, these are just sums and counts. So I really take time to think about for the blog, no one wants to hear about a neural network. They want to hear just you know, things about the city. They're, they're not interested in, in algorithms. So I really take the time to just use very simple things. Often, this means just something like an, an average. Um, uh, so for example, uh, I was curious where people from out of town maybe drive in New York. And, and so I looked at the percent of parking tickets in each part of the city from out of state license plates to start to get a view of, of the distribution of people from out of state. Now this gets a little fuzzy. There's a lot of ifs here. Um, they could be tourists, they could be visitors, they could, they, could have not, they could have relocated and not have changed their license plate, which by the way would be a great way to find those people. Um, 
But uh, you get a map like this, which basically shows that visitors to New York are centered in Manhattan, which is not surprising. And if you go down to Staten Island, which is on the bottom there, there's very few people from with out-of-state plates. And, and as you get farther and farther from the center of the city, there are less parking tickets given to cars with out-of-state plates. It makes a lot of sense. But what's fun is you can do this per state. You can say, all right, people from New Jersey, where are they getting their tickets? And you get a map of New York through the eyes of, of New Jersey drivers, who are at least those who are getting tickets. And you can see that, you know, largely in Midtown, which if you know New York makes some reasonable amount of sense. New Jersey's right across the river there. A lot of people are coming in to work. Um, from Connecticut, you can see coming in from the north. That's where Connecticut is. But the most interesting, I'd say, would be California, because you can see that Californians only get tickets in the hippest parts of Brooklyn. <laughs> That's Williamsburg and Green, Greenpoint. Uh, uh, so we're quantifying coolness per state, which is, which is exciting. Um, uh, stuff like this is funny. You know, I've, I've done stuff like this, and I've had reporters call and say, you know, how did you analyze what methodology? And I'll be like, I counted. And they'll be like, well, I'm like, no, I, I literally just counted. This is just, it's just a ratio. And they'll be like, explain, and they, it doesn't go well. So this stuff is not, this stuff is not a, a New York Post. All right, so uh, uh, this stuff does not, um, uh, it's not complicated. It's just a matter of figuring out the right tool. It's, you know, you can figure it out. Once you get a template for it, you can do things in a few lines of code. You need a little help with programming for this kind of thing, but, um, but there's other things that, that you don't, which I'll show you towards the end. Um, and by the way, I made a map just for fun of, of, of the amount of revenue every state in the United States pays to New York City in parking tickets. <laughs> That was just, a, this one was just for fun. Uh, uh, the, uh, the great state of uh, Washington gives half a million a year only. Texas providing two million in Florida, because I think of all the people who, who live there in the winter and come back, providing close to nine million a year in, to New York in parking tickets. By the way, New York provides half a billion dollars uh, in, to New York in parking tickets. I don't know if those are all paid. These are fines. I don't know the percentage that comes back. And this does not include towing, which is a lot more expensive. Okay. Um, so uh, the last thing I say is sometimes explore the things you know best. Look, a lot of you come from, you, you know, you, you come from your own agency. You know your data. You know things that I have no idea. Um, and you, you can use that intuition. Uh, as a, uh, a lawyer in an improv scene is going to do a really good job, you know, in a court scene than, than a non-lawyer, uh, because they're going to play it really real. So having that in knowledge can get you very, very far. Um, in New York, I guess, one thing, in knowing New York, we have uh, uh, fast food chains, but we have not just regular, I don't know how common this is across the country, but we have combination fast food chains, right? So it's not just uh, Taco Bell, and not just Pizza Hut, but Taco Bell Pizza Hut. <laughs> um, not just Papa John's or Subway, but Papa John's Subway. So we have these combination restaurants all across, and I noticed, just walking around, that maybe they weren't up to the cleanliness standards of their individual chain counterparts. So I could quantify this for the first time. What I found out was shocking. So this is, this is A, anything below that blue line is, is an A score with New York City health inspections. Uh, between the A and the B would be a B, and above B is, is, would be a C at the top. And what I learned is that every single fast food chain that looked like the combination stores did worse on average than the individuals. And in fact, Taco Bell and KFC were, were kind of shocking. Where Taco Bell got 11 violation points, so you get one and two point violations with every inspection. And KFC got 14 on average, but Taco Bell KFC KFC's got 28, 28, so more than double the number of violations for combination restaurants. So that was kind of following my, my intuition there. Um, for fun, I just took all the fast food restaurants in New York and sorted them by cleanliness. Um, and amazingly, I, I, once again, depending on where you're from, if you're familiar with White Castle, <laughs> White Castle got, was the cleanest in New York, which is uh, Taco Bell came in second. And at the other end was, was poor IHOP, um, uh, which, which, which fared the worst. Um, so I wrote about this, and, and um, they sent a news camera down to White Castle, and they're filming, and it was very strange. And this person was like, I knew it was healthy. I was like, I never said it was healthy. <laughs> uh, it was, that, was, that was troubling. So be careful with your data and what people do with it. Um, so, so with all that, uh, uh, I also, as I said, had a goal to kind of make an impact and, and see real change in New York City, in, in my daily life and the life of, of, of my friends who live there, and wondered, you know, where, how do I do this? I have, and one problem today, by the way, is that as citizens, we don't really have great ways to interact with government on data. We really don't. I love to say that there were all these great channels, but especially, I don't know about in, in where you come from, but at least in the New York City world, when you have a data set and there's something wrong, if you think you're going to hear back when you say something, you've got another thing coming. Or you try to report, I'd love to say that there's great dialogue going on between the open data community and our government agencies, but there's not, to be honest, on that set. There, are, there is at a high level, but you, as a, when you have a specific question, there's nowhere to go. You can't call through on one and say, oh, hey, I got this data set. They'd be like, that's not coded in my computer system. What are you talking about? Um, so, so we're kind of missing that. But despite that, I said, OK, can I make an impact? And I'd love to see this change 
uh, and this is not just a New York thing. Like I said, I've traveled internationally on this, and I see it repeated over and over again. We don't have the best channels uh, for bottom-up work. As part from the apps competition, which is our, which is our best thing, we're, we're still missing data bottom-up. Um, uh, we're getting there, though, uh, under, under sort of the new administration, so there's great work happening there. But I, I set out to make an impact. Um, one way was kind of funny. In New York, we have these Metro cards, uh, and every ride on the subway, this is from last year, was, was $2.50. So, you know, so you get a $20 card, you're good, you get, a, a, you get eight rides, and then you can refill it. But, um, but you get exactly it rides. And what happened in New York was that we had, this, uh, we had these machines that would give us these numbers, but we got a bonus, and it was a 5% bonus, and they would try to make all these things. In this and what happened is they'd offer you this screen. They'd be like, hey, do you want $9, 19 or 39 And by the way, the rides are $2.50, and you're sitting, okay. Plus, with the $19 one, you'd get a 95% bonus. So you'd get $19.95 in your card, and the subway rides cost two fifty. <laughs> this is happening for a very long time. Um, now, this can be very frustrating when you're late for that train and you, you, know, you go and you can refill, but you lose the card. It's kind of a mess. And it turned out, I went home and did a mathematical proof that showed there's literally no way to ever empty your card using the MTA. <laughs> no matter how many times you refill. And I found out that the, that the MTA was making uh, tens of millions of dollars a year in leftover balances. So this didn't seem right to me. Um, I, I wrote about this and said, look, uh, I also, by the way, published a, a hack where if you went to other amounts and you typed 1905, that you'd get exactly a $20 card. But if you hit the 19 button, you get a $19. So I would go to the subway and I'd see people start to use this. And I'd be like, hey, that's my number. They're like, get away from me. But I was very excited. I was like, no, no, really, that was me, that was me. Um, so I wrote about this, this went, and the MTA responded. They said, look, these machines do not hold an infinite amount of change, and the denominations are suggested to ensure there's ample change to accommodate customers who pay with cash which doesn't really make sense on a credit card machine, but we'll, we'll let it go. That being said, we will certainly look at this as part of the process involved in rolling out the next scheduled fare increase slated for next year. Thank you. Um, so they rolled me into the fare increase. That's fine. Uh, uh, I waited, and the next fare increase came, and I was like, all right, what's really going to happen? Let's be honest. you know. Yeah. And I go down to this machine, and what did I find? They added a new button for me, which I was very excited about. <laughs> This button, by the way, if you do the math, we have a $3 bonus, $27.25, you get 30. When the, all said and done, under the new, this is exactly 11 rides. <laughs> all the other buttons have changed. But not, this red circle I added, by the way, no one would know why this button is there. And no one would probably use it, but at least we got a new button in the, in, the, in the subway system. Now, I still am a little frustrated because it's the only place that I know where you go in and you can't say what you want to buy. It's like, you can go in and say, I want to buy three apples. That'll be how much. In New York, you can't say, I want to buy three subway rides. There's literally no way to buy, even though it's the same amount, there's no way today, you can only say, I want to spend this amount of money. Oh, we'll give you this amount of money that you have to do math to figure out. That's where we are today. I'd love to see that change one day, uh, we'll see. But small changes. This is a Department of Health records. I told you about the restaurant inspection scores, A's, B's, and C's. Turns out that if you make a histogram and you count the number of restaurants in each category, in New York, anything from one to 13 points is an A. Anything from 14 to 27 is a B. Anything 28 and higher is a C. And if you look at the green section, these are the counts of A's. What do you notice at the border of A and B? <laughs> you notice so a lot of bunching at the lowest A possible. 12s and 13s are abundant. How about how many people got 14s, which is the highest B possible? Very few. We see three to four times more people getting 13s than 14s. This doesn't make sense. These are one and two point violations being summed up. So what's happening here? I mean, the inspectors are, you know, you, 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 you feel a little guilty. You don't want to put the people over. I assume this is not happening just by, um, it certainly wouldn't happen given uh, inspections without borders. Uh, so I wrote about this and I and, I, and uh, heard back from the Department of Health. And by the way, you see the same thing between the B and the C. It's not as drastic, but you see a fall off. Um, and this is unfortunate because you don't want how the day of the inspector is going to affect whether you're getting you know, a fair score. So this is, kind of, this is fundamentally a little bit broken in New York, I would argue. Um, so the Department of Health uh, responded, inspectors are not instructed to see, offer leniency, just to cite what they see. The final score is based on the extent of the violations that the inspector observes. So they didn't really say anything, unfortunately. Um, if I had access to the underlying inspector data through an ID, you could make one of these histograms for each inspector. Yeah, I know, wouldn't that be cool? They have it, I don't have it. Um, and so you could see where this was coming from. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm kind of stuck there, but I, at least I know that someone there uh, uh, is aware of it. I'll retest it in a few years and see if it's smoothed out a bit. Um, we'll see. Um, other things, in New York, when you ride a taxi, uh, at the end of your ride, you're offered, a, you pay by credit card, you're offered a tipping screen. Would you like to tip 20, 25, or 30 percent, or other amount? 20, 25, 30, or other, which is fine. Um, in fact, it turns out about half of New Yorkers hit that 20 percent button. Uh, you know, another 20 or 30 percent hit, hit the larger buttons. And so these buttons are widely used. But when I, I started to dive into the data of, of, of taxi payments, I, I figured out something that was very strange. 
So you ever think about when you hit that 20% button, what are you tipping on? Are you tipping on taxes? Are you tipping on tolls, base fare, surcharges? And the answer in New York, wildly enough, was it depended on the manufacturer of the computer in the back of the cab. So half of the cabs in New York were tipping on top of tolls and taxes. It's been going on for a decade. Half were not. What does that mean? That meant three to four hundred dollars a year for every driver of a cab that had, drove creative mobile technology computers in the back of their cab. So they're making three to four hundred dollars a year more than, their, um, more than the other drivers who had Verifone systems in the back of their cab. This is very strange in such a highly regulated industry in New York. They, 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 you know, the color is highly regulated, the size, and yet the payment system was kind of, you know, w w w w was, was sort of left up to the vendor. So I wrote about this. And I got a great quote back from the Taxi and Limousine Commission, which said, we appreciate the work that went into this analysis, and we're giving it a thorough read. <laughs> now, to their credit, uh, uh, since this point, I've seen, like I said, they've released the taxi data. They've done some great work over there. I'm just giving them a hard time. Um, uh, and, and they've really embraced uh, open data. But what also happened is a few, um, a few weeks after this, they reprogrammed half the cabs in New York City to bring them in line. It didn't go exactly as they planned. Today, all cabs tip on top of tolls and taxes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but at least they're equal, right? Uh, now, we can have an, now, now we can have a separate debate. Should we be tipping on tolls? Like, that's a fine debate to have. But it, you shouldn't have to wonder what the manufacturer is of the computer in your cab to decide how much you want to tip, which is where we were for a decade until data became public. With data that's public, we can start to do this. By the way, it's something that this had never been seen before. Uh, in fact, someone pointed me to an academic paper that had, uh, had kind of brought it up, but the, but the point of that paper was not to look at this, and there was no sort of discussion over it. What happened is so much of the time, this is back before data was open, when, when, when government uses academia to help it do analysis, that's great. But if the data is not made public, there's no way for anyone to verify that. So you, 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 if you want to do really strong, good science, you need peer review. The only way to do peer review is to release your data to the public. Now, you can still do stuff that you're going to have privacy problems, and you can't always do that. But if you're in a situation where you're working with a university, and you are doing some sort of analysis, and you want some verification from somebody outside that group that, that's good work, it's really a good practice to release your data. That's sort of what science is based on. That is a scientific method at work. We see that in physics. We don't see it yet in data science, but, but keep it in mind. Um, also, by the way, in New York, all of our taxis started using hashtags. I'm sorry, all of our police cars started using uh, Twitter handles on, on, the, on the police car. So you walk into New York today, and a police car goes by, check out the back, you'll see, uh, you'll see Twitter handles for the precincts, which is kind of interesting. So they started to use Twitter, which is great. I like a police force that's communicating with, with people. I saw this one earlier uh, uh, last year, which is the fifth precinct had a 115% increase in bicycle collisions this year. Police officers will be enforcing violations by bicyclists. Hashtag bike, space safety which was cool. Um, uh, so there's a couple of things about this. The most, the, what struck me as a data person is 115% increase. Like, that's pretty drastic. That starts to, I, I don't know, I mean, but with open data, we can actually go in and look. I was like, okay, that sounds pretty bad. Like, I get, I get what they're doing. That more than double, there must be something really crazy going on. I went and looked at the data because now it was released as part of Vision Zero in New York City on the open data platform, and it turned out that I saw a reduction in the number of collisions. So this is interesting. So now we're starting to see uh, policy being made by data that we don't really understand what's going on. I love, by the way, uh, uh, and this is not going to happen in the short term, but a world where, 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 where policymakers show their work, right? If you're doing analysis and you're making statements, link to your data and your analysis. We're seeing that out of New Orleans for the first time um, that I'm familiar. There might be other cities out there doing this, but, I, but it's certainly uh, it's been really inspiring that New Orleans is starting to put code online for the analysis they're doing. I'd love to see that uh, across the board. So I wrote about this and wait to see what happened. And the NYPD, they didn't say anything. <laughs> it was worth a try. Uh, but I'd love, to, I'd love to have that dialogue. And the last example I'll show you is this one. These are fire hydrants in New York. And these aren't just any fire hydrant. These are the fire hydrants generating the most parking ticket revenue from people parking within 15 feet of them. So if you park within 15 feet of any of these hydrants, you will get a ticket. Um, and the circle denotes how much money those tickets, those hydrants are generating per year. Now, the Upper East Side had a lot of uh, tickets to give out uh, in New York. Uh, more than two times sort of the rate of, of any other precinct. So that's kind of interesting. But what was more fascinating to me were these two hydrants. These two hydrants were on the Lower East Side, and they're making over $50,000 a year next to each other. Two hydrants making more than minimum wage just being hydrants. <laughs> it's amazing. Now, this was happening, this was happening for a while. This was happening for a good, once again, I, I believe six, seven years. Um, and, 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 you know, I, there must, I was like, there must be something going on here. There's got to be a, a story behind this. So I kind of went and, and to go check it out. And what happened 
is there's basically a hydrant, and then there's what looks like a separated bike lane, and then there's a parking spot. So these cars come in, and by the way, the Department of Transportation painted a parking spot for the cars to park at the spot. Now, technically, it's probably not 15 feet from the hydrant because the width of that lane was less than 15 feet. Um, and so the NYPD maybe disagreed with this DOT uh, <laughs> painting and would ticket these cars uh, constantly. Um, this, like I said, when it was going on for years and years and years. Now, there was a sign that was hung on the hydrant that was written in Chinese that said, do not park here. But <laughs> it was handmade. I think it's still there, um, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but, but cars would come and park. Now, if this had been a bike lane, actually, I think the law says you'd be OK. But it turns out this wasn't a bike lane. This is called a curb extension, OK? Curb extension was just to make the sidewalk bigger. Now, it was used by bicyclists all day, and there were cyclists going, but it didn't have the little bike symbol, and therefore it was not a bike lane, and therefore it was illegal to park in the spot, and therefore people were paying 50000 And that doesn't include, by the way, towing fees, which are much larger. I don't know what percent of, I don't have data yet on the towing in New York, so I don't know what percent of those cars were towed, but it's a lot of money. So this is a, a view from the Google uh, Street View car driving by that spot and seeing parking tickets on the, on the windshield of cars. So if you go through different dates on Google Street View, you'll see different parking tickets on different cars. So it wasn't just me that, that, that caught this. I wrote about this, and the Department of Transportation responded. They said, we have not received any complaints about this location, but we will review the roadway markings and make any appropriate alterations. And once again, I said, OK, well, this, this is a start. You know, I'm just I'm just writing this blog. If I can get something changed, that's always exciting. And a few weeks later, they repainted the spots. They changed the way the parking spots were, were painted in New York City. A lot of credit to, to, the, to the Department of Transportation for responding and, and working so quickly through that, based on sort of just some observations. Um, so uh, it turns out that I guess, you know, as a citizen, you can start to make a difference. Now, you need to find avenues. You need to be able to tell clear stories. And right now, look, honestly, I get that this could be kind of a pain for the agency, but that part of that is because we don't have clear communication channels for this type of work. So my only way to communicate with government is by posting on the blog, having the media pick it up, then the media writes about it, then the government responds to the media, then I get that message. That is today where a lot of this work is happening, which is really, really unfortunate. I'd love to see more bottom-up work in data science from uh, not just the United States, across the world, because you can do amazing things. Um, so, once again, to make an impact in data storytelling, I say it's important to know your audience, connect with, connect with them, try to convey single ideas, keep things simple, explore the things you know best. And I want to show you a quick anecdote um, from, from my uh, class at Pratt. This is uh, data of um, by this motor vehicle collisions in New York City. Uh, that's, that's currently on, on a portal you may recognize. Um, you, uh, uh, you can download that information, and it's very big. It looks like very overwhelming. But, on my, on my third day of classes with one of my urban planning students, by the way, these students have never, they have no data uh, uh, experience at all. But they're able to download a data set um, and use something as simple as, as Excel pivot tables just by dragging and dropping and make a chart like this. So this is, this is hundreds of thousands of rows, and yet uh, my urban planning student on the third day of class without any computer experience because they're interested can start to answer questions about around Pratt, the zip code that we were in, what type of cars were causing the most accidents and was able to make this. So this is not, this is not uh, oh, this is for those you know, computer nerds in the corner. This is really for everyone who takes the time. And we're seeing um, things like data lens that, that, that can help that happen. Uh, another data set, by the way, graffiti. This was done by a high school student who doesn't even have the, the, the drawing, the, the skills, but can actually go put paper to pen and start to answer questions and make a heat map. Um, so so you know, with open data and, and, uh, and the right tools, and if you figure out how to tell stories, I would argue that anyone can be a data storyteller at all. You don't need computer science skills. There's so much stories to tell, but we need that data to get the stories out there. Instead of having that single narrative, we can get an infinite amount of narratives with, with open data. I'm excited to see what, what all you do with that. Thank you.